Good morning once again and welcome to BC 103 New Testament Survey. So even before we can begin our seg sessions with the Pauline Epistles, can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Can I request Jekin, uh, can you lead us in prayer? Sure. Father God, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful time, Lord God Almighty. Father, we commit ourselves into your hands, Father. Father, at this time, Lord, as we read from your word, Lord, Father, I pray that you speak to each and every one of us, Lord God. Father, we commit all of us into your hands, Lord, whatever that you want us to learn, Lord, the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that you will teach us, Lord, and you will enable us to follow that word, Lord, that truth, Lord, that will set us free. And we will be able to serve you wholeheartedly, Lord God Almighty. We commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' mighty matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jekin, for praying. So uh, last class, we looked at uh, the letter to Romans. Uh, actually, I thought we are missing on the introduction to the Pauline epistle. So I thought even before we could start with First Corinthians, we will introduce all the 13 letters of uh, the Pauline epistles, and then we will move on to First Corinthians. Is that fine with everyone? Yes. Class confirmed. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Ren. Thank you. So let me share the slide PPT. Give me a minute. Thanks, Anthony, for confirming. Okay, so yeah, maybe I'm able to see that. Give me a minute. Okay, so the New Testament survey, uh, sorry, the New Testament includes the 13 letters of Paul's epistles. So these epistles are not just a series of writing, but then it focuses on certain topics that the Holy Spirit guided the author to write or the individuals to write addressing certain matters according to the church needs which was during each time during their time <clears throat> so what happened this led to the importance of knowing the circumstance through which these letters were written so apostle paul had written 13 epistles some scholars say 14 that includes the hebrews but then most of them say that the author of Hebrews are unknown. So we will remain with 13 episodes of Apostle Paul. So that these, in these 13 episodes, nine of them are classified uh, into the first two, the Thessalonians, first and second Thessalonians are known, uh, known as the eschatological epistle which was written during the second missionary journey. And the, the letter to Galatians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and the Roman, Romans, these four were known as soteriological episodes. And it was written during the third missionary journey. And the book of Ephesians, the letter to Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians were known as Christological epistles, which was written in the first Roman imprisonment. And the next three, that is uh, uh, first, second, third, first and second Timothy and Titus were known as the pastoral epistles uh, during the final travel of the second imprisonment. So what are these uh, eschatological, why are they classified and what are these stand for? So eschatological episodes where, where both the first and second Thessalonians uh, are, are, are been classified because since these two letters emphasize they emphasize on the second coming of Jesus. So they were probably written within a few weeks of each other. So because they emphasize on the second coming of Jesus, so they are named as eschatological. Okay, that is the end times or the coming of, second coming of Jesus. The next one, the next four, yes, the next four, Galatians, 1st Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians and Romans, known as soteriological epistles. 
vessels. These four are the major the concern the personal salvation means um, it's aftermath. The name comes from the Greek word called sotoria. Or soteria means salvation. And then next we see the prison epistles, that is two, three, four, four. Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Philippians, which is known as Christological or also known as the prison epistles because after Paul's third missionary journey, he was arrested in Jerusalem by the Jews and he was later turned over to the Romans. For two years, he was uh, in the house arrest at the palace at Caesarea, then took his voyage to Rome, where he was held for two years in the house arrest. So, soldier, and this was his first Roman imprisonment. So during this time, we see the two during the two years in Rome, Paul wrote four short epistles, which is known as the prison epistles. So sometimes they are also called as the Christological epistles because these letters emphasize on the doctrine of Christ. And uh, so uh, these three letters that is Ephesians, Colossians, And Philippi and Philemon. We written and sent to get all these three were written and sent. Philippians was written, were known as the pastoral epistles. So these three letters were written to uh, you know Apostle Paul's sons in faith. So Timothy and Titus were his spiritual sons. And after his release from the prison in Rome, Paul was able to travel and establish more churches during these three missionary journeys. So he left Timothy uh, in charge of a large church in Ephesus where he had the responsibility uh, uh, to supervise, along with the church in Ephesus, the other churches around the region. And the same thing happened with Titus. He left Titus at Crete with similar responsibilities and instructions. So, uh, the first Timothy and Titus were written during that last travel of Apostle Paul. So, after the uh, burning of the Rome, by the King Nero in AD 64, the Roman attitude toward the church changed, where Nero continued to persecute the church in Rome until the death of AD 68. Let me show that picture. Just give me a minute. Yeah. OK, these were some of the persecution during the uh, uh, rule and reign of King Nero. So we see he, he crucified the Christians. Whoever believed and followed Jesus were crucified on the cross. And they were also, this is uh, the emperor where the Colossae, uh, they call it as Colossae, Colosseum. So the people, the Romans gathered together in this place to see how the King Nero punished the people who followed Jesus. So we see some of them were crucified here. Some of them were, uh, you know, uh, 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 tied on the uh, wooden uh, wooden uh, cross, and you know, and they were burnt as a live torch. And also, some of them we see the believers were put in the ground, and they were open to the hungry beast, where they came and ate them live. So people had a spectacular watch over these all three incidents, and they enjoyed seeing the believers being burned and killed. So these were some of the persecution that happened during that 
time of King Nero. So not all three may happen at the same time. This image, I just chose this image, which was available on the internet, which showed all these three incidents for our understanding. Maybe each time the King Nero um, uh, chose a different way to persecute the believers. And there was, again, another apostle who was beheaded uh, during his time. Yeah. Yeah, these were some things that happened during the King Nero's uh, uh, reign. Yeah. He persecuted the church in Rome. And yeah, all this happened, incidents happened till his death in approximately uh, uh, 68 AD. And during those years, Apostle Paul was arrested by the Romans and brought to Rome for a second imprisonment. So this time, his confinement was much bleaker and he expected to die as a martyr for Christ. So during his second mission uh, imprisonment in Rome, he writes Second Timothy, asking his young helper to come to him before his death. So being said that, yeah. So here I would like to share about the distinctive emphasis and the contribution of the uh, Pauline epistles. Here I have listed nine letters, that is Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st uh, and 2nd Thessalonians, if you see the first column. Okay, other than leaving out the personal epistles, the personal letters were first and second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. So that makes 13 epistles of Paul, Apostle Paul. Well, the first letter, Roman, described Lord Jesus as Christ. The whole letter describes Jesus or emphasizes on Jesus Christ, the power of God to us. And the gospel message from this letter, Roman says that it's the gospel and its message. So we, we found that Apostle Paul taking every opportunity to share the gospel message to the Roman believers. And this gospel is also known as in Christ justification. The Romans was also known as book of justification. Now, being said that, we'll move on to the first Corinthians. First Corinthians, it emphasizes on Christ, the wisdom of God. Christ, the wisdom of God. And the message that we get from here is about the gospel and its ministry. And the ministry work, how a ministry work need to be conducted. And... And the gospel on the believers' union emphasizes on the sanctification need to be sanctified when we are uh, when we are called for the a call to serve God. We need to be sanctified. Well, that's why the First Corinthians, also known as the Book of New Testament Church Order, there is a order in the church. There's an order in the ministry that uh, 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 that we need to follow. And the second Corinthians emphasizes on Christ, the comfort of God to us. And the message that we get here is the gospel and its ministers. And also it talks about in, in Christ there is consolation. And the book of Galatians talk about the Christ, the righteousness of God to us. And the gospel message that we get overall from the letter to Galatians is that the gospel and its multilators. And the believers union is in Christ, we have liberation, we have freedom. The book of the letter to Ephesians talk about the, the richness of God to us. Christ is the riches of God to us. And describes the whole gospel message that we get from the book of from the letter to Ephesians is the gospel and its heavenlies and yes it is in Christ there's exaltation the letter to Philippians describes Christ as Christ the sufficiency of God to us and the message that we get here is the gospel and its earthlies and there is in Christ there's exaltation and in the letter to Colossians, we see 
Christ, the fullness of God to us. And the, we do get the gospel and its philosophies in the letter to Colossians. In Christ, we have completion. The first Thessalonians talks about Christ as the promise of God to us. We do get the gospel message and Christ's future. That is the second coming. And <clears throat> it also talks about the believers union as in Christ, there's translation. And lastly, the second Thessalonians talks about Christ as the reward of God to us. We do hear the gospel and the Antichrist in this. And then in Christ, there's compensation been shared on this now we can move on to the epistle so we have this as the background in our mind when we study on the each individual letter so we have the letter to romans last week yes we covered all this now we will move on to sorry we will move on to first corinthians where sinners were made saints okay So before writing this, uh, uh, okay. So before we get into the first Corinthians, let look at uh, so, uh, let's look at the background. What is Corinth? What do we know about this city, Corinth? The location, the place, the history, or why was this place important? So the city of Corinth. Okay, let me change. I have a map. Yeah, this map is very clear. Yeah, the map is clear. So the city of Corinth was located in the southern Greece, which is about 40 miles or 60 kilometers west of Athens. And it was almost located on a narrow strip of the land called Isthmus. It formed a land bridge between the Aegean and the uh, Adriatic seas. Well, it was considered as one of the most strategic cities of its day. When we look at the history part of it, this the city of Corinth, back then, in the ancient times, it was leveled about, um, you know, in 146 BC by the Romans. And it was rebuilt by Julius Caesar in 44 BC. And it was established as a major capital for all the southern Greece. So it was established as a Roman colony and therefore a model city for the Roman rule. Uh, a Roman rule or, and uh, many of the Roman colonies in Corinth had a strong Jewish population and also they had a synagogue. That's where Paul visited first. And this place was important because Corinth was a capital city of the southern provinces in Greece that is called as uh, Achaia because, because of its strategic location between the major centers, there was often, uh, 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 you know, more of travelers were attracted and also it was a place of trade. So Corinth was the site of a, um, for a large stadium where the athletic contest used to happen. They hosted the second most significant games outside the Olympics back then. The game was known as Isthmian Games, which held every first and third year of the Olympiad. We see that in uh, First Corinthians chapter 9, we see that there was a game that used to take place. Let's turn to well, First Corinthians chapter nine. Okay, twenty four to twenty seven. Okay. Uh, so, do you not know that those who run in a race? He also described the race because these people were very much aware of these games that was taking place. So, in relating to that, Apostle Paul is writing this, uh, is making this statement for them to understand that. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? We should run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now, 
they do it to obtain a perishable crown but we for an in imperishable crown therefore i run thus not with uncertainty thus i fight not as one who beats the air but i discipline my body and bring it into subjection lest when i have preached to others i myself should become i i my i myself should become disqualified so well as he is uh, teaching about many uh, instances in this letter he is also making a statement in the way that they can understand the people could relate and understand about the race so we will discuss more on what these letter addresses some of the matters that this uh, letter addresses okay um, just give me a minute yeah uh, some of the uh, some of the unique features that this place corinth has is the corinth was constructed a road later it was converted into a canal in 1893 to carry the cargo and large ships so we see that's why it was attracting a larger travelers and there was a, a, a commerce business the business trade was very popular so this place had many visitors coming across the nation to this place so when people came to this place they were also getting the history along with the history they were getting blended with many cultures in this place so during time the population of the city and the surrounding area were about 700000 so it was a very well populated city so corinth in nature the whole city was known for immorality because of the sailors or the visitors the merchants the trade uh, the business people who were visiting the place so one of the most common business that was happening in the city of corinth was to do with the prostitution that was the carnal pleasure which apostle paul is addressing in uh, first corinthians chapter 6 he addresses certain issues about the prostitution that has been taking place where the people of corinth were giving heed to the carnal pleasure pleasure well in english the word corinthian means luxurious licentious coming from a reputed lifestyle of the dwellers of corinth well at the same time this corinth was also known for the temple of aphrodite that is the goddesses of love which stood high above the city and it served about um you know the uh, uh, the history says that this temple had about uh, 1000 prostitutes who served in the temple and this was the major source of revenue to the city so now you understand how the culture and the people of corinth would have lived this sinful nature would have become their custom and norm they wouldn't have realized that this was displeasing god so all, all in all manner there was immorality was a practice of this people in the name of religious experience along with prostitution we also see there was drunkenness was part of their religious ceremonies so there was no way that the people of corinth would understand these were uh, something that is immoral displeasing god because they did this in the name of religion so keeping this in mind let's move on uh, move on to what apostle paul was addressing in this letter so apostle paul found the church in corinth during his second missionary journey approximately 49 to 51 ad so when he was uh, when he was when he visited corinth he first visited the synagogue that was present in corinth usually that's how when we read every epistle that's where apostle paul starts his journey every place apostle paul visited he first goes into the synagogue that is to the jews and then he steps out to the gentiles how when the jews reject the gospel of christ that was carried 
by Apostle Paul, then he steps how to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, those who believe the message, the gospel message that Apostle Paul was carrying. So we see that uh, in, in the similar pattern in the book of Corinthians, Apostle Paul first visits Corinth and he goes on to minister at the synagogue. And he's and he at the same time, he also has a tent making business for his survival. And during because that's a business place. So during his business time, he meets a couple named Aquila and his wife Priscilla. So Paul, uh, that's where he 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 met them and he shared the gospel to them and he also plants a small church or starts a small church with the leadership of Aquila and Priscilla at their place. Later, Paul writes out his welcome in the synagogue and started a church just adjacent to, their, to, to his home. So Paul had good uh, fruit, I guess, okay, in that place because most of them were accepting the gospel in Corinth, including Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue. So Paul had more, uh, you know, a reason to follow up or to interact with this church. So he visited about three times this church and he spent about, uh, he, uh, you know, he had written about four letters to the church of which, uh, they were lost. Just give me a minute. I've addressed it. Yeah. Apostle Paul actually wrote four letters to the church of Corinthians, where the first one was in, uh, he addressed certain matters in, in, uh, in ineffective to correcting the problem in the church. Give me a minute, please. So he was, uh, he was writing to correct a problem in the church. So when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 9, we see that he had written a letter. And this early letter had not survived. For some reason, we have missed it. But some scholars say that a small bitten pieces or a small fragrant of that message is preserved in the second Corinthians chapter 6, um, you know, uh, they, they say 14 uh, to chapter 7, verse 1. So later, the Corinthian church wrote another letter to Paul about several matters that was addressed in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We see about the principles of marriage, keep your marriage vows, uh, uh, live as you are called to uh, unmarried widows, addressing certain issues. You know, there were many questions that they asked. And this letter was sent uh, to three groups, sent by a group of at least three people. Okay. Later in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 17, we also see uh, that uh, another, uh, there were a certain uh, Another letter that was presented, which raised certain questions. And Timothy was entrusted with the task of carrying and delivering this letter. So what we see is the first letter that was written, uh, written in correcting the problems that has been missing. And what we have, the first Corinthians, what we have right now was actually the second letter in response to that. Okay, and the third letter we see, so it was a very severe letter, but then again, that letter is missed. And the fourth letter is also considered to be the second Corinthians after hearing the good report from Titus about how his uh, severe letter was, was received by the church. So this, uh, these are the four letters of which two are missing, two is what we actually have. So, um, as per Acts chapter 18, so it's not just Paul who preached or ministered uh, at the church of Corinth. We also see Peter and Apollos ministered in the church of Corinth. Can I request one of you all to please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 to 15. Can I request one of you all to read? Thank <laughs> you. 
Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of close household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Thank you, Rin, for reading. So what we see here is, there were three people, that is Apostle Paul, Peter, and Apollos, also ministered in this church of Corinth. That was one of the reasons why the church, in the church people there were division. Some said, you know, I will follow them. I mean, all three preach the same gospel, but you see there was a division in the church. They said, I, I like Paul, I, I go with what he says, I like the leadership of Apollos, or I like the leadership of uh, 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 Peter. So this is how the church was divided within them. So Apostle Paul is trying to bring a correction in the divided church to bring a union among them, saying that we all carry the same gospel. It is one who sows the seed, one who, uh, you know, one who waters it, one who nurtures it, the other one reaps the harvest. So in God, in sight of God, all three of them has the same reward. So he's trying to explain that we all are called to minister and serve Jesus Christ and not to serve, our, not to have our own ministry. It is about serving Christ through the call that God has called each one of us. So he's trying to bring a gentle correction among the people whose mind was divided into or uh, paying attention to different aspects. So while Apostle Paul was teaching and preaching in Ephesus, during his third missionary journey, we see some visitors arrived from Corinth, from the church of Corinth, and uh, where he planted. Okay, so what happened there? This group of visitors carried a very disturbing report or a disturbing news of factions, immorality, and within the body of believers, there was division. So while that was discussed or addressed, there was another group came with a difficult letter questioning concerning marriage and divorce, eating food offered to idols, the matters of public worship. And along with that, they also had another question to, uh, about the resurrection of the body. So Apostle Paul is using uh, his God-given power and authority as an apostle. So he pens this letter to address their unacceptable conduct. And also he answers to their questions. OK. Yeah. Um, so that is what this letter he writes and addresses to. So along with that, we also see there are many other issues that he addresses. Uh, Apostle Paul in relating to the uh, issues of immaturity or carnality and uh, how this church was blending the pagan doctrine with Christianity. Uh, it's not just the doctrine, they, all, they carried a culture uh, to do with immorality or the prostitution. They were trying to blend that with the Christian culture so some of these problems were included in the uh, uh, in the church so can i request one of you all to uh, turn to first corinthians chapter 3 verse 1 to 4 and i brethren could not speak to you as to spiritual people but as to carnal as to babes in christ i fed you with milk and not with solid food for until now you are not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For, the, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? 
For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Thank you. Thank you. So he's questioning them, are you not carnal? Because your mind, your thoughts are divided. So we see he's addressing certain matters in this letter. The purpose of this letter was to reply to the problems and the inquiries of the Corinthians church. So from the beginning to the end, we see that is from about chapter 1 to 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to 6, we see it gives a reply to the reports of Chloe's household. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 to 16, chapter 7 to 16, he replies to the letter from the church. So when he is addressing these two matters, we see that he is addressing all the problems that is happening in the church. For example, there was a problem of division. Am I, am I belong to Peter, Paulus or Paul? So there was a division, there was a strife and there was envy. And these things were addressed in chapter 1 and in chapter 2. We also see another problem in this in this church was there was internal lawsuits, which is addressed in chapter six. And in chapter six, we also see the problem about lavish and immoral immoral living lifestyle was also addressed there. And in chapter seven, we see the problem related to marriage divorce and remarriage. He's trying to answer several questions which a different group carried. The group also had a problem with the Christian liberty versus license. So that he addresses in chapter 8. Yeah, he talks about how to be sensitive to the conscious. And in chapter 11, he addresses on the headship and covering. They had this issue about uh, who's the head and should we cover uh, women should women cover the head or not cover these things were addressed and in chapter 11 we see the uh, the problem lord stable there was an abuse for the lord stable that was addressed so people came into the church to eat the lord stable as a food and he was bringing a discipline how the lord stable should be conducted in a proper, reverent manner. And in uh, uh, chapter 12 to 14, we see that the problem of the abuse of the gifts of the Spirit, especially the tongues and prophecy, was addressed to how it needs to be handled when it comes to a corporate gathering. And in uh, chapter 15, we see the problem of misunderstanding the resurrection and the return of Jesus was questioned. And he's trying to address all of this, which I would like to take up this ninth point and discuss it. I thought I will discuss it after um, the key themes that I missed. OK, let me discuss on the key themes. Yeah. So what happened here? The key themes were there were two root problems of the Corinthian church. One was influence of worldly philosophy and their lifestyle, the moral lifestyle that they had. The second point is over-realized eschatology. They want to know about the end time, the second coming of Jesus. So what happened? All these affected the unity in the church unity in the church and then um, they also uh, hope of resurrection do we have though because they didn't believe in the resurrection so will the person have that hope and then Paul also addressed on the true spirituality so when we talk about the unity in the church Paul addresses that the church is to be pure if it is to be a witness to the world then it needs to be pure the unity of the church is very critical to the power of church witness, which is uh, where, that is why uh, we are called that we are God's body. 
we are one body in Christ. So we must all be of the same mind when we are keeping the unity. That's why the church that was divided, okay, is trying to bring the unity, addressing that we are one body in Christ. So in body, there are no different parts. Everyone plays a different role, but still of one body. And then he talks about hope of resurrection, where the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is essential. Now, when he states that, he is making a statement which is very clear. He's making it is not, uh, you know, it is very essential, not only for Christian faith and doctrine, but also for the lasting hope for all the believers resurrection in Christ and also is trying to bring in the spirituality he says the true spiritual spirituality requires the theology of Christ the understanding of Christ or the understanding of the cross that the work that Jesus did on the cross without the cross there is no meaning for our Christian living or for our Christian lifestyle so to correct the immoral lifestyle Apostle Paul is bringing the theology of cross to them so that they understand that they all are sinners come short to the glory of God. And he also addresses that the wages of sin is death. So when when the, the sin nature, the immoral lifestyle that each of the Corinthian believers were living in leads to sin and death eventually. So he's saying, for you to be redeemed from the sin and death, you need Jesus Christ. You need to believe in the work that Jesus did on the cross for you to have the redemption, for you to have this new life in him. So he is bringing the theology of Christ so that they understand and believe in Jesus Christ and they have the redeemed life. They have a life of liberty in Christ Jesus. Okay, so with that, the key chapter in this whole book is chapter 13, which talks about, uh, uh, which is also known as the great chapter on agave love. So undoubtedly, it stands out as the pinnacle chapter for this book. Certainly, there has never been a greater explanation of love that is written by Apostle Paul in this chapter. Being said that, we will move on to the ninth point on this uh, uh, purpose and structure of the First Corinthians, where the other eight points we would be discussing uh, in your third year when we do a deep study on the First Corinthians. As of now, because it's just the survey and due to the time limit, I'll just move on to the last point and I'll try to finish in this class itself. Um, uh, so some of the problem that Apostle Paul was addressing and one was on the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. I thought I will pick up on this point and share a little bit so that we understand. <clears throat> See, the problem here was uh, that wasn't a resurrection, but if it was resurrection, then not even Christ himself was raised. So if they don't believe on the Christ's resurrection, uh, that is on uh, Jesus, uh, that uh, some of them were had a question on did Jesus really rise from death? So if that and uh, uh, was the question in their mind, then they cannot believe that even they have the resurrection in Christ. Then the gospel message that Apostle Paul carried and preached in the church of Corinth or even Peter for that matter, Peter and Apollos preached would have been nothing. So Apostle Paul is trying to bring a clear note to them that we need Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ died on the cross. He was crucified. He was dead. He was buried. He was raised, resurrection and ascension. So he preaches the whole gospel message very clear to them time and again for them to know. For them to have faith on Jesus. That's what the book of Romans says, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. This is what Apostle Paul did. Every opportunity, every question that was raised, every strife, and every issue Apostle Paul found, he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ again and again and again because he believed there is power in the gospel. 
Only the gospel of Christ can save. Only the gospel of Christ can bring correction. Only the uh, gospel of Christ can be the solution to the problem which this church was facing. So he showed them the true wisdom is not found in the world that you think. That is just the grave. It ends all in grave. But believing in Jesus, the death has lost its sting. So he encourages the Corinthian believers who are divided among them to be wise enough and, and uh, you know, believe in Jesus Christ so that they can have an eternal life. They can, they can have an eternal life, a resurrected life in Jesus Christ. So that's why Apostle Paul brings the cross of Jesus Christ into every sin and every divided issues. So because of which, and he also uh, makes a statement saying, we all belong to Jesus Christ because he was crucified on the cross. He died on the cross. He paid a price for you and me. And when we believe, we receive that liberty in them. And all these problems that you are facing uh, uh, with regard to the sexual immorality or the division in the church or there's inequality or misuse of their freedom is because they do not believe in Jesus Christ. They do not have the fear of God in them. So is guiding them back to the gospel message and he's reiterating the message of Jesus Christ about his uh, death burial, resurrection, and ascension. And he preaches the gospel. So with that, he's trying to bring the important church practices to them, which is, uh, you know, in this book, we see that these were the, some of the important practices to be practiced in the local church to do with uh, church discipline, the church service, or uh, the corporate gathering. When we say church service, it's about all believers come together under one roof and worship the God in a corporate manner. Then third, he also addresses the table of the Lord. Uh, the, and he also goes on uh, to address on the ministry of the body of Christ, the importance of the gifts of the Spirit, speaking with other tongues and prophecy and so on. So I would like to end this class with a reflection. Okay, see, uh, our church, uh, <clears throat> sometimes in our time, okay, uh, class, can I just take two minutes, just two minutes, I would like to end this class with this reflection saying, um, in our time, the church is divided, may still find some of these problem that is related to the Corinthian church about immorality or, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, the division or uh, among uh, uh, taking uh, taking a, uh, following different church leaders so we need to have a checklist now and then you know we need to have a checklist to see are we still uh, uh, are, are we still put our desire over the needs of others are we still elevating ourselves over our sisters and brothers or the community among the community of Christ. Sometimes, though we may claim to believe all the right things, we may be missing the way the world has wrapped our theology. So how do we deal with all the problems we see in ourselves and in the church system? We need to think, we need to ask. When we read this letter, the way Apostle Paul handled it is nothing but repeating the gospel about Jesus, reminding ourselves and the people. About the gospel message, about Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, which may seem foolish to the world, but yes, it is God's greatest wisdom. It is God's greatest wisdom. So keeping this in our mind, we can end this letter with a word of prayer. Can I request one of you all to please pray and close this 
uh, session tomorrow we will look into the second corinthians as a letter to second corinthians so that is all about the first corinthians where it talks and addresses on certain issues of the church <coughs> Anyone from the class, can I please pray and close? Sure, sure, Jacqueline, I will share the PPT on First Corinthians on the Google stream. Yes, I will post it. Thank you. Rin, would you like to pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this um, time that we have, Lord, um, to know what you have for us, Lord, in your word. And uh, thank you, Jesus, for speaking to us through Pastor Diana. And, uh, and Lord, I pray that um, we reflect on what we've learned and that you'll help us, Holy Spirit, to make the right choices, to um, know the truth of the gospel, and that um, uh, we will just be uh, living vessels, Lord Father God, for you. And uh, thank you, Jesus. Lord, we send this day into your hands. And thank you, Lord, for everything. We give you thanks. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining in today's session. See you all tomorrow with the next letter. God bless.